Hello there and welcome to this week's Granny's Garden. Now since pruning season has virtually come to a standstill, I thought it might be a nice idea or a nice opportunity to have some mini tours of the garden. So I decided to start this week with the shrub border. Now when I bought this property, in this particular border there were already several mature trees. The first one is the bald cypress. Now I absolutely adore this tree. It's got feathery leaves and when it rains, the little raindrops hang onto the edge of those feather-like leaves like as if they were jewels absolutely beautiful and then of course there's the color in autumn it's like a mix between a copper and a rust absolutely stunning love the tree so now we go from the beautiful bald cypress to the not so beautiful russian olive absolutely hate this tree it gets very tall very quickly the wood is very very dense also it's very shallow rooted and has a tendency to lean unless you are very diligent about staking it well when it's young and obviously this one wasn't so when it gets very top heavy very shallow rooted all it takes is for a strong wind and it goes bloop and it is so tall that what it takes down with us when it's falling is monumental do not like it at all and on top of it it's got thorns like that now the last mature tree in this shrub border is a prunus or an ornamental cherry now this particular one is over 30 years of age and it is a very mature old lady. Ornamental cherries last somewhere between 20 to 25 years. And as I said, this one is 30 years. That doesn't mean that it reaches that age and suddenly dies on you, but it shows signs of flagging. The canopy becomes thinner, very little flowers in spring, therefore very little flowers, very little fruit. And it just lacks luster. It needs to be replaced. Hopefully I'll get a few years yet, but there's definitely signs of saying this needs a new tree in this position, but won't be this year. However, having finished with the mature trees, under the mature trees in the next canopy down, shrubs. And this border has been created virtually from scratch. We're going to start this tour right in the corner with a newly planted ginkgo. This is not a full-blown ginkgo. This is a dwarf Mariken variety. And if I get closer here, you'll see it's got the typical ginkgo fan-shaped leaves that it's famous for. It starts out each growing season with like a more chartreuse colour, then it gets to a, like a blue-green colour, and then it'll start getting double toned towards the end of the growing season, eventually to take on the beautiful, gorgeous buttercup yellow that ginkgos are famous for. The autumn colours are stunning. Now we'll pull back again here. This is a dwarf variety. Some people say about three foot. I don't believe three foot because with dwarf varieties, it all depends on location and climate. And with my climate, I'm probably going to get somewhere in the region of about six foot high. So I'm planning on this getting a little bit higher and it's fluffy on the top. It is a globe shape, but it's not a tight globe shape like a topiary. It's more an open, the one's high like, of course, more open shape. So it's going to come up here and then the umbrella part is going to open out and fan out quite wide. You're probably going to get a good six foot wide and it'll fill out this whole corner and start blocking that part of the chain link fence. So this is the first element newly planted on this side. As you can see, I've got a stake at the moment because it's got quite a big canopy already on a very, very, very tiny, thin, little trunk. So it does need a bit of help this growing season. But as you can see, I've got it very loosely tied. You can move around in there without any problem whatsoever and without getting any type of rubbing going on. Hopefully a very, very nice tree. Always love the shape of the leaves of a ginkgo tree. Didn't want to take on a full-grown ginkgo tree because in this country they get absolutely ginormous. But the dwarf version, the Marican, absolutely perfect. Next one is this hydrangea. This is a vanilla fraise or the strawberry vanilla one. And doing very, very well. This has been playing musical chairs. This is his third location and hopefully its final one. This is going to reach about six foot tall. And again, we'll fill out right to the top of this area and open quite wide either side. This starts off its growing season, very, very pure white flowers, and then it matures into a raspberry pink, a deep raspberry pink, quite a lovely paniculata, and doing very, very well, despite having played musical chairs, not once, not twice, but three times. Talk about tough. The next one here is another Japanese maple. This is the Bihu, and I had to buy this I bought this one online and planted it several weeks ago. It was dreadful looking when I came here and it's now looking absolutely gorgeous. It's really begun to take shape. Now this is the twin sister of... This one over here. 
This is a Sango Kako, the coral bark maple, and in winter it's got glorious bright red stems. This was only planted last year, can you believe that? Planted last year, but this I got in a garden centre. I chose the one I wanted myself. I brought it home in Miguel's car with extreme care. I couldn't get the variety Bihu in my local garden centres. I had to bring it in online, that's why it's a lot smaller. But Acers do very, very well for me. And this has really recovered only a few weeks in the ground and look at it taking off already. The difference is in winter, the one back there is going to be bright red and the one here is going to be bright yellow. So twin sisters. On the obelisk, I've got, of course, this climbing rose that came with the garden. I had them all over the place. I've saved about three of them. They get a lot of rust. I just keep pulling the leaves off as they get the as they get black spot or rust. But it flowers profusely the whole way through the growing season. It starts around about now in May. And it'll keep going until about the end of September, even into October. Absolutely love it. And I love the little pop of colour it gives in this border. The next one in is a variegated hebe, and this again has been playing musical chairs. I had it literally over here. You think, why on earth would you want to take all the trouble to move it only three foot to the left? Well, I can tell you why. If I followed the Russian olive, which I hate up, it goes to the bird feeding station. And I always have a queue of birds waiting. And where do they wait? On the branches. And if you follow it down, it got filled with bird poop. Any type of broadleaf plant is not the ideal plant to have under a bird feeding station. So the one I've got next to it, I'll be showing you afterwards, is not a broadleaf. It's a very narrow leaf. But we'll talk about that in a few minutes. For the moment, the hebe, the variegated hebe, is doing absolutely great. I got it as a small little plant. It's now about quadrupled in size, and that I planted that last year. And it's already coming into flower. Well, you can see it budding up if I can get in. Yeah, all of them have got nice buds on. And it seems to have appreciated the fact that now it's not getting, well, it gets some, but it's not, not getting covered in bird poop anymore. Next one is Cytesis praecox, or otherwise a broom. It's got pea-like little flowers, and this one is a multicoloured one. It's yellow on the top and red on the bottom. It's got small little leaves, vertical branches. It tolerates heat, cold, wind, and even poor soil, and it's drought resistance once established. But best of all, it has got vertical branches tiny little leaves so with a bit of luck the bird feeding station and the bird poop above won't destroy it. Now you might see a little label sticking out just behind it so I hop over the broom you can see that I have a flock so I've got several flocks planted here I've got uh, three different flocks planted here in this border this one is Rembrandt so for the moment I'm just going to have them popping up in between the spaces I have because these things are very, very small. They'll grow, but for the moment they're small. So for the moment, I'm going to have floxes peeping up among the bushes. Next one I've got is a snowball viburnum. She's only a tiny little baby at the moment. She's only about two and a half feet tall, but she's going to grow a lot. This is the viburnum opalus. It's got a very abundant white bloom. It's about three inches across. It's very cold hardy from zone three to eight. It's got a spreading arching habit, just like the type I like, and it can get very tall but it also blooms for a very, very long time. So only a wee baby at the moment, but she's going to become one of the divas of the garden. This one here is one of the ones I'm most excited to show you. It mightn't look like much. It looks like a bit of a twig at the moment, but believe me, it took me all my efforts to get hold of one in this country. I had to bring it in from Barcelona. It's an Abutilon Pictum Thompsonii. At the moment, it's very bare in the middle, but there is sprouting going on at the base and it's bushing up nicely at the top. The variegation on the leaves in actual fact is caused by a virus. It doesn't hurt the plant, but the variegation gets deeper and deeper and splotched all over. I saw this plant for the very, very first time, or this shrub, in the botanical gardens in Bilbao in the north of Spain. I saw it from over 30 yards away and it was so luminous, it just drew my attention. I just had to go over and say, what is this? Thank to goodness, being a botanical garden, the labels at the base. And I saw, of course, that it was the Abutilon Pictum Thompsonii. And I put it down in my little notes saying, I have to get this shrub, no matter what. It will get massive maple-like leaves. They're only baby at the moment, but they get massive. Covered in these wonderful yellow splotches. And then, of course, you've got the wonderful flowers, which are like little lanterns. You can get different colours. This particular one is uh, like a salmon pink, and it's almost got like beans on it. Best of all, these wonderful flowers last for months. It will get between six to ten feet high, so it's going to cover all of this. My only worry is that it might not be cold hardy enough. I'm doing my best. I'm putting it in here next to the fence. 
I've got the canopy of the Russian olive overhead. The viburnum is going to grow. The little Japanese maple is going to grow. So I just hope and pray that it's getting enough shelter and will get enough shelter in winter to become what I saw in those botanical gardens in Bilbao. Absolutely spectacular. I'll see if I can get my hand on a photo to show you what this bush is really like at mature. Wonderful. So next to the viburnum, I have a very sad looking plant indeed. It was only planted yesterday, so it is really, really looking a tad sad indeed. And also the fact that it came on a truck and it had been caught in the bank holiday weekend. And I'm afraid it looks a bit worse for wear. This is, at least it will be, a tri-coloured buddleia. Tri-coloured in the fact that it's going to be purple, pink and white. Not because you do get it on the one bush, but because at planting time they plant together a white one, a pink one and a purple one. And because of the very nature of butterfly bushes, because they need to be sprawling, you're going to get this intermixing of the branches from each individual plant, making it look like the tree in actual fact has three different colours. This is going to get quite tall as well. It's going to reach the top of this fence and probably a little bit more. But I think that's going to make a nice backdrop to that fence. Popping over, I've got another little flocks here. And this one is, which one is this one? This one is Goliath. The next one here, it's a standard one, is the Salix Hakura Nushiki, or the flamingo tree, or the dappled willow, whatever you want to call it. But absolutely gorgeous. As it gets on in the season, you get more and more variegation. And the newest leaves have a, like a pinkish hue as well. So you get like the pink and the white and the green. It's got a very open habit. You can actually sort of make it into a tighter globe. I, as you all know, prefer the more open type. It does have to be pruned to keep it in check in spring. As I said before, this is a standard version. If you want a standard version, you have to buy it. This is one of the few times that you can't make a standard because the branches, as you can see here, are quite flexible and soft. So if you have a shrub and you try and make it into a standard, it gets too flexible and it won't work. You're going to have to stake it all of its life. This is the Hakuro Nashiki staked onto a different type of willow with a stronger base. And as you can see, this was planted only last year, no longer needs any type of stake, staking. And it's a very, very firm plant indeed. There's no way you're going to knock that over. The other thing is the actual stems. All of the newer stems go a nice bright red in winter. So great winter interest there as well. Important, keep it moist. Not saturated, not waterlogged, but moist. The next one up is Wygela Bristol Ruby. Now this one wasn't planted last year, but the autumn of the year before. It's taken a little minute to get there. This, this was the run to the litter. In actual fact, the garden centre gave it to me as a present because nobody else would even look at it. Now this can get quite tall, probably around eight foot, but my idea is to keep it between four to five foot. And I'm going to be treating it from then. And once it reaches a decent height, I'm going to be treating it like I do my forsythias, cutting some of the stems back to the ground every year. But for that happen, first of all, it needs to become established. And the poor little thing needs a wee minute, yes, before that happens. So I'm going to give it all of this growing season and probably next growing season, I'm going to give it its first little prune. As a matter of fact, after flowering this year, what I'll do is I'll come in and at least remove some of the branches that are completely flat against the ground, like this one. But like the Positia, the first thing I always do is remove any of these horizontal the branches that are next to the ground leaving the ones that are more upright because then with the weight they'll open out be absolutely lovely but for the moment that's going to be it now the next one here is the viburnum tinus in spanish it's called durillo which means tough little one and it's probably a very apt name for us because this, you just can't kill the thing it's got interest a lot of the year the tiny little buds in winter are like little pink seed buds then of course you've got the white flowers all over it in the spring and then you can see it is now forming, if we get up close here, it's now forming what will be these like steely blue, bluish, dark bluish metallic like seeds. It does seed readily. So if you don't want those seeds to be dropping on the ground and spreading the bush, it is at this point that you just lop it off and that will be that. You won't have the berries, but you would have had the tight buds and you will have the flowers. This is already, if you can see it here, above the level of the fence. Now I'm going to size controls. I'm not going to let it get huge. I'll probably be controlling it somewhere around about here and it'll spread a bit more as well. So that part of the fence is going to disappear into the background. Now, if I get in behind, well, to one side, there at the back looking extremely healthy. This is the Hydrangea paniculata limelight. So lucky to get my hands on something like that in this country. Very difficult to get hold of. If they have any paniculatas, they tend to be vanilla fraise, but very unusual to get a limelight. 
or a pinky winky anything that's like proven winners type and have high hopes that this is going to again come up to about this level and will fill in the area between the tricolored buddleia and the smoke bush around the corner hopefully my idea is all of these are going to knit together all different colors and textures all together now hopping around the corner i have my smoke bush this is the royal purple if you ever want something that's low maintenance in the garden this is the one for you it's got the purple foliage it turns to a bright red scarlet in autumn it's got the flowers and then it's got of course the puffs of smoke after it finishes flowering what a beautiful bush to have in the garden and certainly one that you just sit back and watch it you don't have to do anything at all occasional light pruning but nothing else again it'll get tall and fill in this space here right beside us we have a cornus this is the cornus causa lovely flowers in spring we all know what the dogwood looks like in spring beautiful autumn colors and very cold tolerant fantastic for my area now i just hop forward a bit you can see there peeking out behind the trellis is a deciduous azalea now i can't plant azaleas in the garden here in the ground because my soil is not acidic enough so i just pop it in a pot when it flowers she gets pulled into view when it's not in flower, the pot gets pushed back as it can take full sun or shade. Right beside it is this very, very old, old rose. This I planted in honour of my mother. It is a blush noisette. Absolutely glorious rose. I have this sort of like a L-shaped trellis and she just sort of like leans against it. She'll get no bigger than this, than the top of this. I had her over the other side of the garden for about a year and a half and she struggled terribly. So I transferred her here last year she put on quite a bit of growth as far as here and this year she's away on a hack you get a profusion of light pink the very palest of pink that opens and then gets whiter and whiter as they age they are delightful especially you can see the trellis through it absolutely delightful and i have got beside it a peony why am i excited about the peony this is the festiva maxima and this is the first time I am getting flowers on my peonies. They do take a minute, they can take between two to three years. And of course, this is a new garden. I planted not last fall, but the fall beforehand. And last year I just got a lot of foliage, but not else. But this year, this year, just look at that. Look at that, the smell is incredible. And of course, being Maxima, it has got just that little bit of festive in the middle, like a little raspberry ripple. Look at that. Absolutely massive and the smell, oh. From now on in, every year it'll get bigger and bigger and better and more and more flowers. What a beautiful addition to the garden. So remember, she is Festiva Maxima. Now down here, I've got the Camellia Japonica. They've just finished flowering now. I've got this one in a pot. Again, it moves in and out to protect them from the, the actual heat. When she flowers, there's not really enough light to damage her. And when the sun gets really hot now in summer, I've just pushed her back under the shade of the wonderful bald cypress. Hopping over the Camellia Caponica, I've got the Nandinas or the heavenly bamboos. This is a wonderful shrub to have in the garden. These got transplanted. I found them when I came into this garden first, completely covered over by ivy. So I pulled them out, transplanted them with only tiny little things and look at them now. They have interest for me all year round. The leaves change color virtually all the time. The new leaves are like a reddish bronze. You get the white flowers that then become glorious sprays of red berries that last for months, all through the winter. What a wonderful plant. So I've got the three of them here, so I don't want to get you dizzy. And then beside it here, I've got the red twig dogwood, that this time is actually finally red twig. Because when I came here first, it was a complete and utter mess and mass and congested, and it certainly didn't even look red twig. The branches were so old and so gnarly that it was just brown and dull and horrible. So over a two year period, I cut them down, I cut a third of them down, trimmed out the rest. And this last year, now this last winter, I had gorgeous, gorgeous red twigs. In front of the red twig dogwood, I have a Hibiscus syriacus. Very, very cold tolerant. That's why I've placed her here because she's right on the edge of the border and gets sweeping winds coming up and coming down. So she needs to be able to take it and she does take it. She took it last year and flowered profusely despite being her first growing season. She's now about, well, she's just slightly smaller than I am and I'm, what, five foot four? So I think she's about five foot, five foot two at the moment. 
So looking absolutely gorgeous and absolutely healthy. I'm very pleased about that. Just a quick sneak peek to the right. I told you the Campanula was going to take over as soon as the moss flocks disappeared. And the Masses Reptans is now disappearing. The Campanula is taking over. And what a mass of flowers we have. Can I get there, right there? That teeny weeny weeny one there is another Phlox. This is Hercules. This is not doing too well. It got stepped on by the dog before I had a chance to put, <laughs> to put in the rings. Because those rings are not for the Phlox. Those rings are to stop the dogs going in. In the few minutes it took to go and get the rings, the dog had stepped on it. So looking a bit sorry for itself, hopefully it'll get there. Now right at the front of the border, I want to show you this one. This is a Baronia crinolata. It is in actual fact of Australian origin, but it gets on so well in the Spanish climate that you can find it now wild outside in the mountains. It's drought resistant. It gets to be about three foot tall and about two to two and a half foot wide. I would mulch this up in winter and it does uh, appreciate some shade, particularly in the afternoon in a hot country. But it blooms and blooms and blooms all through the season. It starts in February and goes through until about end of October. Tiny little leaves, tiny little flowers, but profuse amount of flowers. Absolutely delightful. A little bit of a shaggy one here. Gorgeous. Now the next one is Coprosma, the one in the pot. This particular variety is Pacific Dawn. And I just love it because it keeps changing all through the season. In the beginning, you get green with the pink borders. Then you get sort of like a darkish brown with the pink borders. And then almost like a pink purple brown with pink borders. And the best thing, low maintenance. The only thing you need to do every spring is come around and if you have a wayward branch that sort of sticks up, you trim it off and that is it. You don't have to do anything else. The light is very bad at the moment here, there's too much sun. But these are so glossy, that's why it's called a mirror plant. It almost like reflects the light. And you can see the different variegations. You get the new leaves coming out and they're sort of like green. And then they start turning and aging into this pink purple and then almost like a pink dark chocolate brown. Absolutely lovely. This one, Pacific Dawn. Not the easiest to find, it's very easy to find the chocolate ones or Pacific Sunset, but Pacific Dawn, a lot more difficult to find, certainly in this country. It does have flowers, they're going to be pretty insignificant, but it's mainly for the foliage because it's evergreen all year around. It's also very cold tolerant and it will grow probably around about three to four foot. Up here at the top of the border I have three Ito peonies and I didn't take note of where I was planting each one, so I've got to wait till they flower. Now this one flowered last week and identified it as Canary Brilliance. Now the other two I have here are Bartella and Magical Mystery Tour. Bartella is going to be a dead giveaway. At the very second she opens, the bright yellow, <laughs> no mistaking her. The other one is new for me, Magical Mystery Tour. I'm absolutely so looking forward to seeing this one. Even the name, look at that, Magical Mystery Tour. I've got a bud, is that going to be Magical Mystery Tour? We'll soon find out. Well, this border is virtually finished. Well, in a the garden, there's nothing ever really very finished or completely finished. It's always an ongoing task. But I need to just let this now mature and have the things knit together and form that beautiful tapestry. I hope to see you next week here in Granny's Garden. Until then, bye-bye now.